sure. It's preferable um, luck elves. Awesome that you're all here despite the weather, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, welcome with Hugo. Uh, what, what's on the agenda today? We have two talks. First one, as you can see, uh, Prana and Graf here out. And the second one, the guy over there will tell us a bit about Docker and Dockerization. And yeah, where else that, I guess? Well, let's go. <laughs> so, um, before we start, this guy will say a few words um, about us, what page you make. Yes, uh, a warm welcome from my side. Uh, Joachim, CTO of Figo. Um, two words about Figo. Figo basically can give you a B2B company and we can grant you access or give you access to bank data. So we connected ourselves to a 3,100 banks in the background. We normalize it into a single API and uh, allow developers or, or, or businesses to read transactional data, account information, initiate payments, and all this kind of stuff. We partner with a lot of fintechs out there, with big banks like Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank. We also partner with PayPal for, for different use cases. So uh, we have a quite broad API. You get a lot of different use cases with it. Um, but uh, everything is in any way related to a bank, basically. We uh, use Node.js in the back end when we talk about the connectivity part, like reading data from banks and so on, it's where we basically use Node.js and um, we're actively looking for Node.js developers, as maybe everybody <laughs> out there, but if you can imagine working with banks and stuff like this and you like the office beside of it, it's warm, uh, uh, you're welcome uh, to, to grab those guys here and uh, talk to them basically how is it is working for Figo and so on and um, 50, 53 people right now, um, one hour one of our biggest investors is uh, Deutsche Börse, which is also quite good, having some neutral player and neutral player in the, in, the, in the background, especially when you work with banks. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, happy to have you here and enjoy the evening. All right, before we start, just one last question. Is it okay for everyone to be on the photo? Quick hand, if not. Cool, so then we have a nice lady <laughs> snapping to this photo. Alright then, without. So, welcome to our talk. I am Corneli Hopman. And I'm Jacob Evans. And we want to talk about uh, GraphQL, give you a little bit of insights of uh, the things that we've learned in the past few weeks and uh, some other stuff. So, let's start. Oops. Make sure to I built the presentation software because I thought it would be cool and I didn't support arrows. <laughs> so, who are we? Uh, we are uh, Node.js developers in an open source group uh, called Hamburg Chimps and are currently working uh, at Cybus in uh, industrial IoT topics. We are uh, GraphQL enthusiasts who want, to, um, who want to share the recently acquired knowledge with the community. I've been living in Hamburg for almost two years, live uh, a bit ba uh, further south, for about four years, and um, I'm looking forward uh, to stay more time here in Hamburg. Yeah, uh, I'm Jacob. I yeah, I've uh, I've lived in Hamburg for like a few months now. Uh, really enjoy it. Hamburg's an awesome place. Really like working here in Germany. Kick ass. Um, yeah, I enjoy getting mad while playing board games or any kind of game, and uh, I enjoy learning new things and new technologies. So let's get started. What is GraphQL? Um, GraphQL is not an implementation, just to start with it, and it's not owned by Facebook. If you heard, okay, yeah, the guys at Facebook created this, yes, but they don't own it. What is GraphQL? Uh, GraphQL is a query language, and most importantly, it's a specification. 
And the good thing about uh, not being uh, an implementation in itself is that you get the power of multiple people implementing the spec. So you have multiple open source uh, <laughs> specifications. Um, the first one was the, uh, the one that Facebook did, uh, uh, Relay. But um, we are currently using um, Apollo as an example, that you don't have to use the, the Facebook-related stuff if you, if you don't want to. And like, as I said, it's an, a specification and not an implementation. No, it's an open source community. It's an open it. source community. The guys that did Meteor are the like or Meteor are the ones that developed it, and they're the main uh, contributors to the software. But it's open source, and a lot of different people um, contribute to it. And we we fell upon Apollo um, versus Relay after kind of comparing them, just because the community, the tooling, and they're really taking advantage of like the newer like it's funny because Relay is made by the React guys or made by Facebook but they're not really taking advantage of like what the React or the larger JavaScript community does, at least in my opinion. <coughs> Apollo really is. They're really pushing the envelope of what you can do with the tech. Yeah. So that's why we kind of chose Apollo as the one that we're using and the one that we use in our projects. And those are the ones more vocal in the community. Uh, those are the ones that are pushing the most blog posts uh, at the moment. Uh, you have the most references on YouTube uh, are using also Apollo. So it's kind of the go-to uh, thing right now. Yeah, the, their, their documentation is awesome. I can, like, if you want to go, like, we, we have some resources in this uh, repository we'll send out later, but if you want to go learn more about GraphQL and how to do GraphQL, the Apollo website is awesome. Yep. So let's get a bit into uh, what I told you that it's a, a language uh, query specification. So. Um, we, it's a strongly typed uh, language, so uh, we have different types. Um, we have uh, the normal scholar types, that would be uh, the normal integer type, float, string, boolean. Then we have a special thing called the ID tab uh, type, and it's a, a special kind of uh, scholar type in that sense that it's used to uh, fetch or refetch an object or use as a key for uh, caching that object. Uh, going to talk about that uh, when we get into the front uh, end side of stuff. And the only thing that you need to take care of it is it has to be serializable to a string. So if you use some alphanumeric stuff, then you're good to go. And or if you use uh, UUIDs, you're also good to go. So that's the only important thing about IDs. Um, the other uh, cool thing is that you can um, create your own types as we see here. I created a, a city type. And um, we, had, we had a question. Uh, oh, sure. Oh, sorry. How is that? Can you see that a bit better? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that for a bit and we can scroll with that, yeah. yeah. So um, you can define your own types. As you see here, I'm uh, using the ID type for ID. Uh, um, the exclamation mark means that it's a required um, property. Uh, if it's missing, then it's an optional property. We have some uh, examples when we get to the tooling, how that plays, uh, how that plays nicely with everything, and um, and um, you have another type of object. So um, that type of object is the input object, and you use that if, uh, for example. Uh, once uh, you have uh, more complex objects that you want to uh, query or to do mutations with, I'm going to show that in a second, then you want to separate um, the normal objects from the ones that you are using to get the data of. So, and um, you have lists, and they are uh, demarked by the uh, 
by the uh, by the square brackets. So these are not all your types. You have more complex types, but to start to uh, start with uh, GraphQL, these are the <laughs> most basic types, and with them uh, you can do a lot. Uh, that means that it's required. So like, yeah, like we'll get a bit into it more later, but like, yeah, when, when it's in a type, type are like basically what you get back or what you need to make something. So when you have an exclamation mark, you said, if you were ever gonna make an object of this type, you have to give me this kind of data. Or, when, yeah. yeah. Or with an input, you're saying, if you were ever asking for something, you have Not to give to, me this yeah. information. It's not optional, you have to give me that. That's what the exclamation mark means. Yeah. And uh, if you um, see it in here, I'm actually defining another uh, object. So another uh, type of object. So uh, objects can be complex and um, have uh, sub-objects. And um, GraphQL brings a cool thing with it. List of different types. So, no, you mean like uh, you mean if the list can have different types uh, of themselves? No, you have uh, like uh, here you have uh, a list of districts. Yeah. yeah, every it's a rule of GraphQL that everything has to be able to be reduced down to smaller types. If you have complex objects like city that has a district, district has to resolve down to a scholar type. It has to resolve down to like one of the you know like. Can it be mixed types? Mistype? No, they, like so. Right here, specific. Um, yes, that? you can, but that's with more complex types when you're using interfaces and okay, okay. that uh, sort of stuff. Yeah, but you're able to. So, um, um, we have a special uh, type that's the query type where you define all your. Uh, so to say, get functions, the, the functions or methods that you use to, to get data out of your, uh, out of your app. So um, the queries are uh, read-only fetch. They can have multiple arguments. And the cool thing about GraphQL is once you, uh, once you uh, do a query, you can specify exactly what data you want to get back. So, um, for example, um, in the in this query, I'm getting all the cities with. Uh, if you remember, uh, this was a boolean. I'm gonna get if it's discovered or not. I just want to have the name. The country is uh, a complex type, and I want uh, just the code, the country code from that type. How a response looks like. We're coming to that. So, um, as uh, as I said, you can have uh, multiple uh, objects in an object, and how it looks like underneath it on the back end is that um, you have resolvers for your uh, more complex stuff that. Uh, uh, that um, give you the, the possibility to make highly complex uh, or highly uh, relationable uh, queries. So as uh, in the example, you saw that I was asking uh, for the country, so I can actually uh, hide that, uh, that business logic in the resolver and, um, and get that item and give just enough data to the uh, client consuming my API. So, mutations uh, are just like queries, uh, but with the uh, small big difference that they are used to, uh, to modify the state of your application, to put uh, things in it, and um, they also have this property of uh, GraphQL where the, you can always specify uh, the things you want to get back. So, um, so, so um, does, yeah, does everybody get that difference between queries and mutations? So 
they're, they're, one is just like the get equivalent and then mutations are just everything else. Get allows you to specify what kind of data you back, select everything and mutations allow you to create certain things with input objects or say this is the data that goes into making an object and then request back what you want. Yeah. So. Cool. So now let's uh, get into some of the tooling of it. We've been talking about like the uh, the concepts behind it, but I always find like a, a good tool and actually seeing it like live helps out quite a bit. So part of what's really cool about the GraphQL community is not only, sorry, and no, I'm gonna slow myself down here, but I'll, I'll tend to talk really quickly when I'm excited about something. Um, part of what's really cool about the GraphQL community is not only are they coming forth with this really cool specification that everybody's supporting, is that they have really kick-ass tooling with it. And GraphQL is one of my favorite bits of it. I'm gonna pull up GraphQL real quick. There we go. Uh, GraphQL stands for the GraphQL IDE. So a lot of the time when you're you know, making these mutations or these queries, you wanna test out what's actually happening on the backend server or whatever points you're hitting to get this data back or to create new things. GraphQL is kind of like, I would say, or uh, GraphQL is kind of like Postman, if you've ever used Postman, but Postman for GraphQL. It allows you to test these things out and actually see the results coming back and then use these same queries and mutations in your actual live applications. Postman on steroids. Post, Postman on steroids is an yeah. excellent way to put it. Um, what's really cool as well about GraphQL, like with the specifications that you're writing with types, input, and everything else, is that we had this kind of conversation out there as well that it's almost kind of like Swagger. Who in here has used Swagger before? Right? Swagger is kind of like the specification for HTTP. You say these are the arguments going in. This is what you can expect back. Like, when you write a GraphQL specification with these inputs, queries, and mutations, you're almost writing a Swagger file, but for GraphQL. And what's really cool is you can take that same file and put it into GraphQL, and it will generate the documentation for you. So what's really nice about this is you're not having to look at like, documentation endpoints and trying to figure out what returns what. You can pull up GraphQL, and you can just immediately start, start playing typing, around, yeah. and you can see what data you're gonna get back. You can just get right into the nitty gritty. So for example, um, I have this uh, shopping list application that I've built before. If you want an implementation reference for a simple GraphQL app, it's gonna be in this repository at the end, and I have it started up. And let's say I wanna make something. So we have our root query type, and again, queries allow us to get data, and then we have a mutation type which allows us to make data. So I just started up the application for the shopping list. I don't have anything yet. So I'm gonna go ahead into the mutation and let's see what kind of mutations I can, make, uh, I can do. So you can see I can create an item, I can update an item, and I can delete an item. And you'll see that these have input objects, which tell me what needs to go into actually making these, and they have response objects, which actually come back from this. Input objects, um, the queries and mutations, they can have multiple arguments, and once you have uh, lots of arguments, it's easier to, um, to, um, to organize them as an input object. You can also reuse input objects in multiple places, so if you want to try out your code, the best practice that, uh, that the community came up is using input and input objects. Yeah. They're like type definitions in Swagger. Right? Yeah. Cool. So let's go ahead and try this out. I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a create item. So to start out with, you use curly braces here. And to specify that I'm doing a mutation, I'm going to write mutation in front of it. You can even give it a name. Mutation, this is true. We could give it a name. I can call it this is gonna be my create item mutation. Yeah. And then inside of it, I'm going to call this specific mutation create item. So I'm gonna go ahead and it again. GraphQL being as awesome as it is, it will start to autocomplete, create item. And again, I'm gonna put parentheses. This is gonna be my arguments for whatever this mutation is. It's gonna autocomplete for input for me. And I'm gonna put in that the input object I'm giving it is gonna take these values. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the type for create item input to see what needs to go into a shopping list. So it needs a name. So I'm gonna go to the store and I am going to go buy some milk. Uh, what's the price? How much does a, like, uh, a liter of milk cost? Uh, I don't know, one euro? One cent, yeah, yeah. And it's actually, uh... Int. Oh, an int? Yep. Yeah. One. And then it needs to take a user, who's ever actually using our application. So I'm gonna specify a user here. 
which is going to be an object. And then I'm going to go ahead and click on the user type to see what goes into it. And again, we have these complex objects, but they always have to resolve down to these scholar types. So first name, I'll put my first name here as Jacob, last name as Evans. And there we go. I can actually create an item now. I'm going to go back up the list here. And then I'm going to say back when I actually create an item, this is when I want to get back. So if you see here, and I'll go back here, this is the response object of whatever my mutation gives. And if we look at the response, I can get a Boolean for whether or not my operation was successful, and I can get the message from the server. We defined this uh, response. That's not a uh, part of GraphQL. We are defining this item. Yeah. So you, you can, again, and you can send back whatever you want to. This is just something that I've made. So if we look here, this data that we've gotten back from the server, the create item mutation resulted in a success true item was created. And I'll go ahead and I'll just make another object here or another grocery item. Let's say I want to get some eggs. And eggs cost, like, let's say, two euros. Two euros. But with the same user. And I'm getting back again, create item, success, true, message, item created. So now we've tried out one of the mutations. You got a bit of a feeling for how the mutation work or works. Let's go ahead and try out the query. Do we have a question? Go ahead. One user with the specification. Uh, with well, with this implementation in yeah. our backend. Yeah, yeah it, it, it depends on you how you process that. But um, yeah, in our case, we are, uh, we are just having one user. If it did take multiple users, you would see square brackets around this dictating that it was an array of user inputs and that you could provide multiple users. Because you don't see square brackets, my implementation only takes one user. Mm -hmm. Because we use the, the sort. You don't have to type a string, but you still use literals for both in the string and dot, right? Yeah, I think it's a yeah. subset of, or a superset of JSON is what it's defined as. Sort of. Sort of. Based on JSON, but it's a roller from JSON. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, if you were to, um, if you want to update, for example, a type, maybe it goes up to three, three euros. Yeah, we could go try that. We could go to the update. And the update says that it needs the ID back. Oh, uh, the ID back uh, to actually get the ID of the item. Since I made a quick response, we're going to have to do a get request real quick or uh, a query real quick so I can get back the item. So let's do that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the query types, and then I'm going to get back to the update. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. Let's so, that. Yeah, no cool. worries. Um, oh, knock on. Yes. So I'm going to go and let's specifically, let's get back all the item that I put into my grocery store list. And again, this living document of what my GraphQL specification was, you'll see I have item, items, and users. And let's go ahead and I want to get back all the items that I put in my grocery cart. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this mutation. And I'm going to say query. I want to get a list of items. And it takes the first name. And again, if this was a more complex uh, query, then you would uh, use an input type. Yeah. With it being just so simple here, I didn't use an input type. And just to also show, you can just use an array of arguments as well. Yeah. Um, and you'll see here back that it sends back an array of items. That's what the square bracket here uh, denotes. So I'm going to click on the item. And I can ask for anything that I want to get back. So first of all, I'm going to need the ID for the uh, update. update. Yeah. So let's just ask only back for the ID. I don't need anything else right now. I just want to know what the ID is. Oh, and the name. Or let's get the name as well. Yeah. But I don't actually care about the price of anything. I just want to see what I have in my grocery cart. So if I go ahead and execute this, you'll see back that I get it data, which has my items query. And it populated all these JSON objects with the ID and what their name is. Let's say now that I actually care about the price, I can go and I can ask about the price. And now I can get the price back. Let's say I want to know what user actually created them. I can go and I can specify. It's a complex uh, uh, object, so we can specify more uh, stuff that we want to have from the object. Uh, can you take the, we just want to have the last name. The last the, name? Yeah. Oh, we can do that as well. 
So you can ask specifically for what data you want back instead of just getting everything by default. And, and we'll get into this compared to REST and HTTP a little bit later, but just kind of an example there. But it was requested that we update the grocery cart. So yep. let's go ahead and I'm gonna update. Uh, uh, I'll go for it. Yeah, a second. Question, I'll go for it. Can we actually see this result by surprise not more than something? You um, will need to implement that logic, yeah, but you can surely do that. Yeah. So basically it's depend it depends on backend implementation. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's basically an abstraction over your backend implementation. Yeah. So if you wanted to get all the items in your cart or with a specific price, you would then go ahead and in this query, you would make a um, like a cost or like an items or like let's say in items, but you would give it the arguments of like min cost and max cost. Like a range. Yeah. Yeah. Probably you could, uh, it would be best then to use an input type. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So let's go ahead and I'm going to go to mutation. Let's go to the update and I'm going to go ahead and delete this. So I'm going to make a mutation, update item, and let's see. Real quick here, what the update item takes in. It needs an ID, and you, you see here that it actually requires the ID. The ID is required because I need to know what specific item that I'm updating, so I'm going to give it an input. ID with the ID of, let's say, the price of milk has gone up because everybody loves milk. Uh, and let's say, yeah, we're updating the price. So let's say the price has gone up to uh, four, four euros. euros. Yeah. And then we're just going to get back the uh, whether or not this was a success. OK, and it's successfully updated. Now, this will give us an opportunity to test out our query here. Let's get back just the one item of the milk and see what uh, data we have on that. So I'm going to write a new query here. I want to get a single item back, and that takes an ID, and it returns an item, and an item has, let's say, a name and a price. And we got name is milk, and the price is four. So we successfully mutated it, and then requested the data back. And again, so this is just kind of showing off the tooling and what it's like to actually use GraphQL and using mutations and queries. We'll get into like what that looks like in further implementations. But here's the tooling for you, and that's kind of like a live demo of what mutations and queries look like. Was there any questions on that before we moved on? Cool. Go for it. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, like uh, that's not uh, part of the GraphQL server. So if you're uh, like no. You have all the possibilities that you have with Node.js to connect to a database. So, uh, like just a normal uh, s web server, right? Like where you are the one uh, managing the connections to the different data stores. So, I don't know if that was your uh, question. Um, like, how does how does it like if you wanted to connect to multiple? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, it's basically what I understood when I read first of all about GraphQL. <coughs> is uh, that it allows you to connect to different data databases and then join tables from different oh yeah storage, um, uh, storage yeah devices. we are yeah we we are uh, going to show some of the how you can structure your project and code to be able to support that more easily like what they are uh, trying to uh, like one of the main selling points of GraphQL is this kind of uh, all, uh, all grabbing uh, API on top of some other things, right? So, um, but we're getting into that. Yeah, and that's the idea with like kind of the resolver logic in this. Again, so this the is- The resolver and connector logic, yeah. And we'll get into that a bit later, but the idea here being that you make a request for this, like this kind of data, and when you get into the actual logic of how the GraphQL server is written in the back end, it doesn't care where it gets the data from, it just collects everything, puts it in this data model, and then shoves it back out to you. We'll get that a little bit more into the back-end implementation and the back-end logic of it. Yeah. Cool. And a uh, good thing, uh, yep. What happens if the same required input and you don't see what the input is required? Oh, yeah, you want to get rid of the ID? We can try that. Syntax is error. So since it pulls the, the specification of what should go in from the server as well, it won't execute any commands. It's using some valid syntax. Mm -hmm. So then you have the same as functions that you have kind of a duplicate 
because we have this wire bounce rate power emitter, mm -hmm. so you can have signatures in the back end mm -hmm. where, where you have bounce rate power emitters on the input. Yep. And exactly. if you give them, maybe the answer is different than if you don't give them and so on. So exactly. Exactly. So really like a RTC system, which uh, we, we can really put in if you want. Yep. Yep. Do you need to like filter the notification in the server to avoid? Uh, uh, for the things back? Actually, that's one of the uh, one of the coolest things about that is that the server actually just returns what the person asks for. So, if your, for example, if your user does not, if you didn't specify in your GraphQL um, um, in your GraphQL file that you are able to get the password, then the uh, then your user is never able to get that back, if that's your question. Like, if it's not defined there, it's not going to show on the client. Yeah, I, I, I gather the filtering of the data from the server is yep. hidden on the side of the server. But what if, in the field of ID, I will write SQL state in both data rooms? Oh, you're saying does it do, like, so you're yeah, saying? Yeah, different types for injection, actually. No, this annotation is to up to you, like, oh, yeah, I got yeah. So like again, so like think of like GraphQL as a layer that sits between you, the client, and then whatever databases that you have or whatever results you have. We'll get into the logic of the back end a little bit more, but the idea is that your connector or whatever is actually connecting your query or mutation to the logic itself, like a REST client, a Postgres database, or like an, uh, let's say like, uh, like AWS, you need to then write the specific logic of sanitation or anything else or use your own tooling for it. This is just an abstraction layer over the top of saying, I want to get some data and I don't want to have to make a million requests. I just want to make one request or one mutation and let it fan out to all the different types of data that I have, such yep. as Postgres or whatever, and then just get something back. I don't care where it goes or what databases or what um, interactions you have, whether or not it's sanitized. GraphQL doesn't care about that. It just gives you this abstraction layer in order to get everything back and to send it things back, or and to mutate everything at once and let it cascade to the different types of things that you have. One more quick question in the beginning. So, so say you had, because you said you implement your backend yourself. Mm -hmm. Say you had, a, which I don't know which technology is, it doesn't matter actually. Mm -hmm. but, but you get a, a query, query for example, in your backend. And in your backend you have an exception. Oh, yeah. And you never answer. So how, how, what does GraphQL do for me there? I mean, how does it handle exceptions on the backend? Well, you do actually get uh, an exception thrown uh, to the client. Like if something not working and you return an error, then uh, the client gonna get that error. But if you swallow the error, then uh, it's, um, in that case, it can time out, I guess. It can time out, so you make it not, not an answer immediately, but after some time you have a longer, longer. Yeah, and then your payload, like whatever you send back to the user, that's all the kind of your responsibility for how you form it. If you, again, you get to decide what the user gets to see and not to see. So let's say if you get an, accept, uh, an exception thrown, your GraphQL logic to say, okay, one of my connectors failed, this is the payload that I'm gonna send back to them. And you can make, then they could say, oh, I only wanna know the status code or the, the message of the error back. It's your responsibility to define what the user gets back from the error as well. If it was like, if something failed and it just didn't connect, you would just get like a timeout request or something. Oh, is, uh, is this me? Oh, oh okay. Um, REST versus GraphQL. Um, REST is not uh, that different from GraphQL. GraphQL is just an extension built on the REST interface. They both allowed us to do CRUD operation on resources. The difference is an architectural, con uh, the difference is that REST is an architectural concept for network-based uh, software but has no official uh, tooling or specification. It's just designed to decouple an IPE from a client. And it's actually just a paper that got released eight years ago. So, um, yeah, eight years ago. <laughs> and um, GraphQL is, um, is a query language, a specification, and a collection of tools designed to operate over a single endpoint. So the difference between um, the whole debate about 
is this rest, is that rest, or is this, you don't get that. It's a specification, you know what GraphQL is. And uh, so just like talking a little bit about before we get into the back end and how to structure your back end and recommendations for that, just a little bit as, uh, as a front end guy primarily, like what it's like to work with this. This is kind of a lot of the benefit of using this comes from people that actually consume the data. So what, what's the differences in front end architecture? Um, the thing is once you, like what we see with GraphQL uh, or GraphQL is that it's incredibly straightforward to fetch data when using GraphQL. Normal request usually requires that like let's say we're getting a city we have to say forward slash city, forward slash ID, get this back. And then usually if there was a country or some subset of our complex object in that, it would give me an ID back. And if I wanted to get the country or anything back, I would say, okay, get forward slash city, the ID forward slash uh, country. And it would give me the country object back. And then if I wanted to get the districts, I'd have to do another get request and I'd have to get that data back. This was kind of the idea with REST, right? Is that you would just go URL further down if you wanted to get more complex data types. With GraphQL, you can just enable by saying, I want this kind of data, and it gives you back the data that you specifically asked for. You don't have to hit all the endpoints that you need to make your data or your, your model to actually consume with your application. You just say to this endpoint, this is the data I want, this is all I care about, and I don't care where it comes from or how the backend devs deal with it, just give it back to me. And that works really, really nicely because it allows the backend devs just to do whatever level of abstraction with the different databases that they do. If they switch from Postgres to InfluxDB or to MongoDB, it doesn't matter to me as long as they sp send back the same specification file, which is the GraphQL file. As long as they return the same data that I asked for back, that's all I care about. Go for it. And the filtering on the backend side or the front end side is the same? Yeah. Filtering is in the back end. Okay, so or, to really reduce the traffic, if you ask for less, you, you send less. Right? Yeah. And another benefit of it, um, it depends how your uh, GraphQL server is implemented, but on the query side of things, uh, queries, and uh, you saw that, for example, city had a country, and that uh, resolving of that complex object is done as asynchronously. So once you hit the, the, once you do the query and it has to resolve multiple uh, complex objects, uh, depending on your uh, server, uh, GraphQL server implementation, uh, the server is actually going to uh, perform that resolving uh, asynchronously. So, so, yeah, meaning like I can say I want all of these different things from all of these different resources. They cascade down. They all resolve themselves. They come back. They build this data model, and then they just get it one big chunk yeah. back to the user. I don't have to worry about all these different parts loading in asynchronously. I can just get it all in one big chunk which again is really nice as a front end guy. I don't have to worry about, oh shit, like this is loading in later, this is loading later. I can just build this one solid application based off of this data model. And which makes it a lot easier to maintain on the front end as well. Also React with GraphQL. React kind of really plays nicely with GraphQL, right? GraphQL says with properties, tell me what data to pass down and I generate the actual component for you based off of the properties you sent down, right? plays really, really, really nicely with GraphQL. Here's the data I want, give me back the data, populate this component for me. Pretty straightforward with that. They go really, really nice hand in hand. Because again, GraphQL allows you to say, I want this data, and React says, okay, this is how I want to display this data. And just as a kind of quick example, again, we'll have an implementation if we have some time to reference it. If not, the code will be up on GitHub and you can look at the documentation. But what it looks like is I say, here's my query, I want to get the country and get the country ID and name. And for the actual component, I say, okay, here, and this is the Apollo specifically right here is the code. Uh, I have a query, the query, t uh, I'm passing you this country, and then I get the loading error and the data back. I want to get the actual country. And here, I'm going to zoom out a bit with this. Uh, give me a second. I can't see the, there we go. Oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, if it's loading, I'm just going to return this loading GIF. If there's an error, I'm going to output the error. You can handle the error however you want to. If not, I'm actually going to take that data and I'm going to say, hello, welcome to country.name. And again, I didn't have to hook in Axios. I didn't have to have Redux Thunk or anything else. I just said, this is the data that I want. Make the request, get the data back specifically, and then populate the component with it. It's really nice to develop front end with this, especially with React. Go for it. Where do you define your endpoint? Is it provider? 
Oh, um, in the actual client specification, you just say here is the, uh, like um, with the Apollo Boost client, you just say here's the URL for the GraphQL endpoint that I'm hitting, and then any queries that you make will get hit off of that. Okay, so if, that's maybe some objective and arbitrary uh, component. Yeah, it's, it's passed down to the provider, uh, oh, yeah. provider uh, syntax in React. Does this support objective as well? That's, we have some Q&A at the end for that. Yeah. That's a big question in the, uh, the GraphQL community. So some talks uh, about core or, uh, code organization. So um, I, like the, you said, uh, one of the main benefits that's being promoted by the community is to, that you can put GraphQL on top of whatever you want and uh, it's gonna do magic and unicorns and you're just gonna get the data back that you want, right? But how you do that? And one thing that we find um, quite useful from some blog posts of the uh, guys from Apollo was um, how they uh, separated things. And they brought this idea of having connectors, connectors to different data stores. So um, you define your uh, different types. We are uh, using plain uh, text files to define our uh, GraphQL endpoint. And we combine that with some JavaScript to, uh, to uh, actually have the business logic. So uh, in, in this file, for example, in the, uh, in the um, schema file, we have all the different object types that uh, we are able to resolve. And that will be, for example, this is just uh, the Gorilla Auth code. We have uh, a grant type, we have a group type. And on the mutation side, we have different, um, different uh, functions that, uh, that change the state. And, and the way they look inside is um, you define your different types. And, uh, for, and with the example of city, you would then uh, write a resolver for the city, use a connector, and in the connector you put all the logic to the stuff that you want to uh, grab from. So um, one of the best practices that was uh, put everywhere in the community was that you tr uh, should try to keep your resolvers small and use the connectors for, um, for getting the data uh, out of uh, the different data stores. If I can just take a sec to clarify that as well, just like to, re to rehash it. Yeah. So query has a resource, city. I want to get a city. The city has a resolver in the back end. This resolver says they're giving me this and I need to give them back something. The resolver then has a connector. I'm using Postgres, I have my Postgres city connector that says, go to Postgres, this is what they're giving me, give me this back, format it in the correct way, and then send it back to the user. Yeah. The, res the connector, or the connector is the specific thing connecting to your database, whether that's REST, whether that's MongoDB, whether that's any type of resource. The resolver consumes this, and the resolver is called by a query or a mutation to resolve the operation and then return some result. The type files are just saying, this is what any incoming or outgoing request should look like. Yeah. Does that kind of like help solidify like how you can connect to all these different kind of technologies? It's that there's this middle logic that says, like think about it as like a div here. Somebody said that they wanted a city, so I'm passing that to Postgres, but somebody asked for a user and our user database is in Mongo. GraphQL, specifically the server, is this middleware or this guy in the middle that's passing things out to the right guys, getting the data back and then passing it out to yeah. the correct Uh, you're yeah. that's the the thing about that that uh, the queries that that those are just specify uh, uh, like uh, on the uh, front end how you resolve that on the back end I mean if your ID is the same ID in multiple databases and you can just with that ID get from Mongo and get from, uh, get from your caching or something, uh, then you can just go with the same ID. Or if you can have some sort of uh, more complex logic in a sense of you're not using the ID but uh, 
you are, uh, for example, looking to, uh, to every group the person is member of, for example. That's a more uh, complex query, and you can hide all that uh, on the back end. And the front end devs, they just get the queries, get me the groups, uh, or uh, this is my query, and this is the data I want to get back. And the uh, back end devs are the ones that are responsible of, uh, of using graph, uh, the GraphQL server as this glue thing and uh, pulling from the different data stores and uh, merging it so that um, our front end can consume it. And like the connector, like the resolver logic kind of helps with that. You have a query, the query says I have a district and like I have, or I have a city and the city has districts inside of it. So I hit the query, this says it has a district and if you don't provide the district data inside of this return that you're giving it, it will look inside of these other resolvers. If there's a district resolver, it will then try to resolve the district inside of this with whatever database you had and then return the final result back. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna try to answer these questions really quick because our, our friend here would like to give his talk as well, so real quick. How do you ensure the consistency between multiple data that you provide your policy and actually executing? Uh, the consistency is the fact that your data model has to match whatever you <laughs> specified into your file. Are you saying like that giving one query, you're always getting- How you problem? synchronize? Well, that's up to you. That's not uh, up to the uh, GraphQL server, okay. so. You mean, can, like, can an object implement itself, or yes. like, yes. That's actually a, a thing that we have with our Gorilla Auth. The danger is that is that you can get infinitely recursive with your yeah. query. Yeah. yeah. But then uh, I was talking about that with schema, because you can't just have an infinite recursion in the schema language itself. You yeah, have well, you, you can, you can produce, uh, if you're, uh, okay. if you're so building you your queries uh, automatically through programming your queries yourself, then you okay. can do, uh, you can definitely do a recursive uh, query yeah. where you ask for, for example, uh, a user and uh, he's member of a group and then you go into the groups and you look for the, uh, the of members of that group and then you get one user of them and, and so on. So, and, that and that's why you don't use uh, objects as input because uh, they could have circular dependencies in themselves they don't have the requirement as the input objects that they need always to resolve to a scalar type. So what I, what I think he's saying is that it won't actually resolve that way. Like you'll have a limit of somewhere where your code actually breaks, but in your actual, I, I think is what you're saying. Like it won't actually let you do that, but in the query itself, you could write an infinite query. Yeah. In fact, if you look at yeah, our open- You couldn't send it to the GraphQL endpoint because uh, the schema you define that gets sent to the endpoint and somehow answers is the loop. You can't just send an infinite like JSON like oh. structure, structure to Oh, you're saying it has to have a finite point. Uh, yeah, otherwise it will never be complete. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk about that afterwards. Yeah, yeah. We have a specific example we can show. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. we have one more. So <laughs> there are more things that we want to explore. We have used GraphQL in some uh, small uh, projects at work, uh, but to fully embrace it, we uh, need more, uh, more, uh, more uh, battle testing on how you do uh, authorization. Authentication is not that uh, complicated, but authorization uh, there is, as always, not a single strategy that you can use. So we are exploring that. Also, how to um, initialize our connectors. We are not that happy with it. And um, one of the biggest questions is, uh, I have this one single endpoint, and I have this one single server. So how do I load balance this? So uh, we're uh, having a look into that and more advanced queries where you can 
uh, use in interfaces or fragments or more, uh, more of the complex types of GraphQL what, uh, is the stuff that you can do with it. Cool. And then just, um, like, I think we'll skip past the Q&A because he would like to get to his talk. We kind of had some questions throughout. Shameless plug time before we say thank you. Um, like for you guys' time. We appreciate it and it's awesome as well. Like we say, we're not really experts on GraphQL. We've just been exploring it and this is what we found. And we came to have like these kind of conversations as well. But uh, shameless plug, um, like if you wanna find the, the notes for this talk or a working like small application, if you don't know, um, if you don't know how to do GraphQL and you wanna know JS implementation, uh, implementation, you can go to github.com forward slash Hamburg chimps. That's the open source group that we're a part of. Um, and they'll find Node HH talk that will have all the notes. They'll have an example implementation and then links for resources if you want to go learn more about GraphQL and Apollo specifically. And there we have uh, a more complex toy, uh, toy software where we actually <laughs> show how you can, for example, offer a REST interface to the outside, but in the inside use your GraphQL server uh, to minimize uh, or to ease up uh, the transition. Uh, if you're uh, having uh, uh, an REST interface or REST API and you want to support that, but you want to move with GraphQL, you can do that and hide GraphQL uh, underneath the, your uh, REST interface. And we have some examples how yeah. to do that uh, also on Hamburg Chimps. Yeah, and it's called Gorilla Auth is the open source toy app that me and uh, yeah. Tor have been working on. Has some more examples and has this infinite recursion bug and some of the other things that we've been kind of hitting, you know, like the problems that you have when you go through GraphQL if you want to see what an implementation looks like with Node.js. And we're also exploring the authorization, authentication strategies there. How to best secure your data because as you saw, you have multiple endpoints uh, or multiple, or you can connect multiple data stores underneath it. So how you uh, actually give access to the data to the user that is allowed to see it. It's not just as an easy question as with, uh, with REST. I can uh, use uh, the, the path as my, uh, for my uh, authorization authentication logic. You have to think a bit more about how you could actually access a data uh, piece. Since there's multiple so, ways of getting to one place. So, cause there are more multiple ways to getting in one place. So there are, uh, there's uh, uh, no clear way how to, uh, uh, to realize the authorization part on the GraphQL. But if you have something, please come to us and, uh, and have a discussion with yeah, us. Yeah, and let's talk about authorization and infinite recruiting with that guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for your time, though. Yep.
the pack have a clip? Yeah, perfect. Yep. I can. All right, so hi, hi. I'm uh, Jason. I don't have any slides, just forewarning. Um, so gonna chat with you guys, like I said, about ships and whales. So we're gonna talk about Docker and Kubernetes. Um, so first thing, show of hands, how many of you have heard of Docker? How many of you guys are using Docker? How many of you are using Docker in production? How many of you guys know Kubernetes? How many of you guys are using Kubernetes in production? <laughs> One hand. <laughs> All right. Wow, we weeded them out fast on that one. All right. So I have a confession to make. Um, the first time I wrote Node was today. I started about 16 today. Um, so please, dear God, forgive me. My code is probably terrible. You're all going to hate me. But I used Express, and I heard that that's good. So hopefully that gives me some brownie points. So um, the first thing is a quick overview of our application. Can you guys all see that? Is that big enough for you? The right. Yes. We'll, we'll just ignore the left side for now. I'll tell you what files we're navigating to. Hopefully, you'll be able to figure it out. So this here is a Docker file. Hopefully, based on the hands, most of you guys have seen one of these before. And it's pretty basic. I'm actually not using best practices. You can see I've been using Docker for too long and used the maintainer label still instead of using a proper label. But hey, sorry. Um, basically, all I'm doing is copying in or creating a work directory that I'm operating from, copying in my stuff. I run a yarn install. I expose 3000, because apparently that's like the normal node port. And I tell it when it starts to run npm serve. It's all pretty basic stuff. I have this horrible package json thing that does a bunch of stuff. Most of it doesn't matter. I think the only thing that actually matters in this is this particular line right here, because all of this I totally copy-pasted from something else that I had worked on in the past. So what we actually do in the server, we're just serving a couple of endpoints. Most important endpoint for me is this guy. How many of you are familiar with health Z and ready Z? or health and readiness endpoints. All right, so there's like three. Most important endpoint that you can have in any application is going to be health Z for somebody like me. I don't work as a developer. I work as a platform engineer. I run the Kubernetes platform that has served other companies before, and now I'm here at Figo to bring them into the modern era to run everything on Kubernetes. One of the things that Kubernetes needs to know is if your application is healthy. If your application is unhealthy, it's going to do something beautiful. A beautiful thing that it's going to do that we haven't done in the past. Most of you guys, I'm assuming, set up a VM to run stuff on in production or maybe you use Docker and containers to run stuff. 
but you probably like just restart a container. Kubernetes doesn't. Kubernetes is like Honey Badger. It just don't give a fuck. So it's just going to walk over and it's going to shoot your container and it's going to make a new container to replace it. Everything in Kubernetes ideally should be stateless. If there is any state that should be stored, it needs to be stored outside of the container. The way that it knows whether your application is healthy or not is A, it watches the process to see if that process is still alive in the container, and B, it will do a health check. Common convention says we use slash health Z as the health check. You can configure that as you wish, but it will only keep your container alive if that says, hey, I'm healthy. Very important. Easy way to say I'm healthy, return 200. If you don't have any complex dependencies that you rely on, if you don't know if your application is broken or not internally, return 200. And then I know, as Kubernetes, if your application is alive or dead. More interestingly, I mean, you guys write Node, so it's relatively fast, and you don't have a lot of dependencies. If you're writing Java, for example, I've had the pleasure, we'll call it, in some of my Kubernetes clusters running Java applications that take over 20 minutes to restart or to start up before they're actually ready to serve traffic. That makes them horribly ineffective if you start adding them to the load balancers right away to be able to serve traffic. That's where ReadyZ or the readiness endpoint comes into play is now your application has a way of telling the Kubernetes or whatever you happen to be using, yes, I am ready to accept traffic. I have everything that I need to do my work. And I return 200 now, and I can get traffic. If you don't return a 200, it, the instance doesn't get any traffic. And all of a sudden, you don't have you know, maybe 50% of your load going to an instance that isn't ready yet. So just something to be aware of. So we've got a couple of fun and interesting things here. And then, is this making sense to everyone first? Everybody on board so far? Awesome. So like I said, we've got these cute little apps. So I've got a front-end server, same kind of thing. All it does is serve an index.html. And I've got a media server, which theoretically serves stuff from slash uploads, which in slash uploads, we have this fantastic monkey. Bears resemblance. I think it might be my brother. So what we are going to do now is I cannot. It's impossible. Actually, maybe literally I cannot. <laughs> ah, there we go. I was terrified for a moment there. This is a very new system for me. Uh, I just installed Ubuntu 18.4 and it broke everything. So. I was running Arch before that. Everything was always broken. That's the difference. <laughs> so what we're going to do, I'm in the uh, media server here. I'll just back out and go to the front end server. And we'll do a quick Docker build. Uh, and we'll tag it to FE server. And we're doing the fantastic build. Do, 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 do. Apparently, I took a little while. And it's doing its fun, exciting thing of building stuff. Now, as I mentioned, today is the first time I've ever done anything with Node um, as far as writing any of the code. I'm a Golang guy. Golang and Node have a very interesting history just like to point out, just to do the language wars thing, that the creator of Node has said that if you want to write an API, do it in Golang. 
as a result of that, I really didn't want to install Node and NPM and all of those kind of fun things on my computer. So I just built this fantastic Node thing, but I don't have Node at all on my computer. I don't have this Node package manager thing with the exciting teapots going on. I don't have to worry about my system getting infected with all of that excitingness. I, but I still get all of the advantages to be able to do the stuff that I want to do with Node. And even though I have code sitting on my machine, and even though I need to build that code, I don't have to have Node on my machine anymore. I don't have to worry about it. And if I want to get rid of Node so that it doesn't infect my machine any more than it already has, it's literally a Docker RMI, and I get rid of that image, and it no longer infects my machine. So, I know, I know. <laughs> Bad form, right? Bad form. No, I mean, to be fair, Node does have its use cases, and it is very effective at doing some things that Golang sucks at. So, all, all things being fair. So, the m bigger point is, if I want to do anything with... If I have to do anything with Java, I don't have to put Java on my machine anymore. I don't have to put a JDK. I can literally just use it in a container, and it doesn't infect my machine with all of the Javaness. I love coffee. I hate Java. So that's... <laughs> um, so we've now got this fantastic little FE server container. And sure, I can go onto my machine and do a Docker run, and I can... Uh, map the ports to uh, see it and what it was called, FE server. So now I've got this thing running, logs to six, and I can see that, hey, it's there, it's listening on 3000. Um, please, dear God, uh, local host. I could curl too. But hey, look, that's pretty. It's the index file. I don't want to curl an HTML page. Come on, man. It just looks messy. So there we go. I've got this fantastic thing. But now, what the hell do I do with it? How do I get it into production? So, Docker RM Force. What was it called? 26? 26. Good memory. It's too hot to remember things. So there we go. It's gone. So this is where things actually kind of start to get fun. So how many of you guys have ever had the opportunity to deploy an application to Kubernetes? Oh, wow. OK. I thought the number was going to be much, much higher than that. So uh, maybe I need to take a step back here. Thankfully, I prepared some, or semi-prepared some resources here. I hope to God that, uh, no, no, looking at too many things here. There we go. All right, so that, da, 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 da. Let's run through the concepts of Kubernetes. So the first thing is Kubernetes is declarative. You can't do anything imperatively in Kubernetes. Even when you do things that you think you're being imperative about, all you're actually doing is creating resources on the API. So everything in <coughs> Kubernetes is declarative, which is beautiful. And the whole thing is based around control loops. Control loops are used all over the place. Um, and the controller pattern is, is one of the most powerful things that you can use, especially in microservices. We've talked about that internally at Figo quite a bit. But it allows you to decouple your apps and not have to worry about serialization anymore or parallelism. It's so bloody convenient to allow you to decouple control structures. 
And all controller loops do. They're used in robotics all the time. Um, you know, if you look at, I've got one of those uh, drones, those DJI Mavic drones that you can fly around and it does a bunch of stuff. And it's got all of these computers on there and sensors. But all they're really doing is something really simple and really stupid. They're dumb. And I love dumb things that can be combined together to do awesome things. But dumb apps are fantastic. 500 lines of code, 1,000 lines of code to do something that on its own is boring and useless, which is what most of Kubernetes is at its core, and compose all of those things together to make a very highly intelligent, highly effective, scalable system. Um, control loops just go and do the same thing we do all the time. Current state, desired state, diff, resolve. Current state, desired state, diff, resolve. What is happening around me? What do I want to be happening around me? What's the difference between those two things? Do something to get me closer to that ideal state. We value simplicity over complexity. We're, there is a lot of complexity inherent to managing systems at the scale at which Google does, but still Kubernetes is understandable to me. I'm an idiot, so as my colleagues and other individuals will tell me, I mean, I just bashed Node at a Node meetup. You know I'm an idiot. So um, it's compatible with legacy applications as well. You might not know that. You might not be familiar with that. But you can literally run anything that you run in production today on Kubernetes. You might not leverage all of the advantages of Kubernetes, but you can most certainly run it inside Kubernetes today. Um, and it values, the most importantly, cattle over pets. Like I said earlier, Kubernetes will walk around like honey badger and just don't give a fuck. It'll go and just shoot whatever it so feels. And so you have to architect your applications around that so that they can die. But it also means that you don't have to worry about these snowflakes anymore. You don't have snowflakes because everything's created from this same image, this same copy. So some of the concepts of Kubernetes, we'll just break it down real fast. I think I have my boot to do. Yes. So we have a concept of masters and workers. Um, this is slowly being changed to be called the control plane instead of masters, because a control plane doesn't necessarily have to run on segmented nodes. It can run inside the cluster for the most part. Um, in fact, most of the cluster implementations now for Kubernetes run the controllers and schedulers and API servers inside the Kubernetes cluster. The only thing that's really special is etcd. So, the cool thing about Kubernetes is everything in this, with a, the exception of etcd, is stateless. There is zero state within any of the components in Kubernetes except for etcd. Everything that does need to be stored and is stateful gets stored through the etcd server, or sorry, through the API server to etcd. That is the only point of persistence. Those are the only pets that you have in your cluster. Even your applications inside the cluster become cattle. The only pet that you have is etcd, and you want to take care of it. Now, you have a concept of pods. So pods is basically an encapsulation around one or more containers. It's also an encapsulation around any volumes or data that gets mounted in, and it also is a wrapper around the namespace. So a pod gets its own IP. You can almost think of a pod as being something similar to a virtual machine. Similar, I'm going to have Kubernetes guys tracking me down any moment for saying that, but you can think of it pretty much the same way. It gets its own IP. It's its own box where you can run one or more things inside. So. <clears throat> And labels. Labels are what makes Kubernetes powerful. They're the only thing 
that makes Kubernetes powerful in and of itself. Everything is selected off labels. Everything is dictated off of labels. So you can have metadata that tells you how I'm going to route traffic around my cluster, and it's all just controlled by labels. So it allows you a lot of power. It allows you a lot of flexibility. It also allows you to shoot yourself in the foot relatively easily as well. So it's something that you should understand how labels work to be able to leverage them effectively. Um, we're going to skip over this real fast. Ah, service. So you have a pod. Pods need good traffic. So you can think of these as like the container. I mentioned earlier that you need to have a ready Z. The ready Z maps to a service. So Kubernetes is constantly checking. And you never talk to a pod directly. You always talk to a service. All a service is is a virtual IP that is shared amongst all of your pods. We just use IP tables and route traffic. When you send it to that service IP, route it to any of the pods that happen to be available to serve that traffic. We know that they're available to serve that traffic based on that readiness endpoint. So one of the things you can do is if your service is getting uh, an instance of your service, rather, is getting too much traffic, it can also go, OK, I'm not ready anymore. Let me satisfy the requests that I have now, deal with those, and then I can move on and come ready again once I've recovered from handling all of these requests. Maybe I'm working an infinite query that has come in on GraphQL, and I can go, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of things. Don't send me anything right now. I'm out. I can still keep working on that one particular problem, but I don't take any new requests, and therefore I'm not timing out any new requests that are coming, because they can go to this guy over here, and he doesn't have that infinite query. He can go ahead and handle it. Your question. Am I ever going to be killed if I'm just not ready? After being ready for a while? So the question is, am I ever going to be killed if I'm not ready for a while? So no. Kubernetes will never kill you based on whether you're ready or not. You could be not ready ad infinitum, and Kubernetes is never going to kill you. It's also never going to send you traffic. It will only kill you if you go unhealthy or if your process dies. So, but good question, for sure. If nobody's ready, you get whatever nobody is. So this is all done at layer three. So you'll get probably a conref because there's nothing there to listen. So that's, that's the most probable. If you're doing this at layer seven and it gets passed through, there's a thing called an ingress controller that handles all layer seven traffic ingress for the cluster. And that will usually return like a 503 um, and just say, hey, I don't have anybody to send you to. So Go away, come back later. But you know, in the case of this, because it is layer three, you'll basically probably just get a conref. What So the question is about sticky sessions or session persistence. So there's a couple of ways that it's dealt with. So if you open a connection to an instance, that connection for the duration of the connection is held to that single instance. Your, your traffic isn't going to be moved onto another correction. If that instance fails, you'll see that the connection is closed and you know, or times out, and that's it. Um, however, if we're talking about layer seven and more of like the sticky sessions where I need to talk to the same web server or it's ideal for me to talk to the same web server. The most common implementation of the ingress controller is using Nginx. Kubernetes is a pluggable ecosystem. 
ecosystem. Let me try that again. Um, and so Nginx is the most popular uh, ingress controller. It handles sticky sessions just fine, just like it normally would outside of Kubernetes. So HAProxy is another example of an ingress controller that does layer seven and can also do layer three ingress, and it can also handle sticky sessions as well. So, so the reverse proxy would sit in front of the service. You don't, so in Kubernetes, you've got this overarching, we'll pretend this gray box is the concept of the cluster. You don't get to talk to the service as an external entity. You talk, you, theoretically you can, but that's way advanced and almost nobody does it. Usually you have some mode of ingress, whether that be an HA proxy that's sitting here on the edge that will ingress your traffic, or layer seven ingress as well, Nginx, traffic, HA proxy, whatever, sitting at the edge and ingressing that traffic and then sending it over to that service. It, it is. I mean, all it is is a virtual IP, so you're just using, you know, best effort. Basically, it's just IP tables that's going to send it to whatever connections I happen to have available. It's not going to try and intelligently load balance anything, but it's load balancing inside of the cluster. It's not for load balancing coming on ingress to the cluster. So you had a question back there. Yes. Hell Z would be implemented in one of the containers. So one of the containers would respond with a slash health Z endpoint or another endpoint. Yes. Sure. Cool. So if it's a database, let's talk. MySQL, for example. Yeah, exactly. So there's a port check. There's three options within Kubernetes to do health checks. You can do a port check, which for MySQL is perfect. It will only open 3306 once it is ready to serve traffic. So you can just continue to use that as a readiness, and as, you can use it as a readiness. Uh, you wouldn't want to use it as a health because it will kill you as you're trying to come up. And if you're trying to come up and can't come up successfully and get killed during that process, that can potentially cause some issues with data. What you can also do is do an exec, where you run a command to check a PID, you run a command uh, you know, using MySQL CLI, and see, hey, you know, what's actually going on in the database? What is my state? And you can run literally a bash script if you want to check to see, hey, what's going on inside this container, inside this application? Is it up and is it ready? This is perfect for something like a Redis, where you might have a Redis slave that's still copying data. You can run an exec. You know, it it's probably has the port open, but it's still doing copies. You can now run an exec where you're asking the Redis instance, this slave instance, how far behind the master are you? How close to the master are you right now? And if you're not in sync with the master, then I'm not going to send any traffic to you until you're in sync. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, there, there are some ways that are specific to the Docker Swarm implementation that allow you to do that. Um, but basically, they are just metadata that's exposed around the container. The unfortunate part with that um, is that that isn't bound within what's called the Open Container Initiative, or OCI spec. Um, and as a result of that, the only thing that can leverage that currently is Swarm, because Kubernetes, Mesos, et cetera, they're abiding by that OCI spec. So they only care what's actually in the spec. This isn't in the spec. We aren't going to listen to it. We aren't going to pay attention to it. 
because there are a lot of other implementations, things like Rocket or Run C or App C, etc., that don't have the ability to introspect that, and different container formats as well, like Rocket containers, where they don't provide that same type of metadata yet. So it's something I would love to see adopted into the spec because then it pushes more onto you as the application developer to know how to check your application to see whether it's healthy or not. And that's the beauty of all of this. Is this, like I said, I'm an ops guy. Most of you guys, I would assume, are developers. I'm dumb. I don't know a damn thing about your applications. I literally wrote Node for the first time today. I don't know a thing about how to deal with your applications, but if you give me a well-known endpoint or if you give me a way to introspect and ask your application, hey, are you all right? That gives me huge power and that gives you huge power too because now I'm not guessing whether your application is working or not. I don't have to come to you and go, hey, your application is fucked up, man. It never works, it never runs, and it's just me doing something that you didn't expect. It makes it very simple now for us to communicate via these specifications, and I can run your application without ever meeting you, without ever knowing you, without ever knowing anything about your application, as long as you adhere to some very well-known standardized things. And that's the beauty of what the Docker file being able to expose that is, is that now you have this ability to introspect your application and define that as being metadata of part of this whole package, as it were. So, yes? Sorry, and just for clarification, you said there's a few different ways of checking the health of uh, the bus. Yeah. Who, who's executing or who has the information about the bus? Is it the service? Is it the pod? Like, who's running or like, where does the command say, this is the way that you check the health of the container? Where is that actually saved? So that's saved. That's a complex question. Sorry. Kuber yeah. Kubernetes, yeah. Kubernetes is relatively decomposed, but we'll, you know what, we'll jump back because that's a good question. So the controller, so first off, I push in my application to the API server. The, my manifests that define my application, which also includes where to check and how to check for health and how to check for readiness. Those get persisted into etcd. Then, these controllers go, hey, it's time there's a health controller, or technically it's a pod controller, that all it does is run a controller pattern. And as part of the controller pattern that it's doing, when it asks for what is the current state, for it to get the current state, it says, oh, I've got a health and readiness check here. I'm going to execute those. So it will go ahead and talk to these kublets, these are the things that actually are on the node and talk to Docker, and they'll say, hey, go do this thing. Whether it be doing an HTTP hit, whether it, or HTTP, HTTPS, whether it be a port hit, or whether it be an exec, the kublet is responsible for running that and persisting the result of that to the API server. Once that's persisted to the API server, or sent to the API server and persisted in etcd, I should say, then that pod controller will come back around and go, oh, yeah, hey, this health check succeeded. This readiness check succeeded. I can continue to send traffic here. I can continue to keep this alive. So, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, so the health checks are performed on the pod, and you can have multiple containers in pod. Yes. So Mm -hmm. Each container has the ability to do a health check. Yes. Yeah, the kubelet talks to Docker to ask. Yeah. The whole pod gets kicked. Yeah. We we never recycle a container. We go, this is a unit of work. And you know, it, it's like saying, oh, this horse. Oh, this is a good example. 
this horse has a broken leg. So I'm just going to go and cut off its leg and try to put a new one on. We don't know if the, you know, it breaking its leg has infected the rest of the things. So we just go, better be safe than sorry. Let's just kill this one and, you know, hopefully the other horses will have babies. So... <laughs> And you could ask my colleagues. I'm not exactly a nice guy. <laughs> so, oh, and speaking of one of my colleagues, yes. How do we post mortem this horse? So, the beauty of this horse is after we've shot it, we still have the corpse, right? We still have the container sitting around. We still have the logs. We still have the ability to go and look at it. And shooting basically means stopping. Sh shooting means removing in this instance. But it's a container. That's the beauty of the thing. It's a container. It comes from an image. There is nothing that can happen in that container outside of, like, I don't know, some muons happen to hit the stick of RAM in just the right way to corrupt a piece of memory. And then in large distributed systems, I mean, it's been said many a time, I think Julia Evans even has like a comic about it, but literally, like when you get to large scale systems and distributed scale systems, like weird shit just happens. And sometimes it literally is stuff like, well, a muon just happened to hit this RAM stick in the right way to corrupt this sector of RAM in the perfect way to make it do return that it's, you know, lollipops are great or something like that. It, you don't necessarily care about the container. You care about being able to look at what is the log output, what was the metrics output. Metrics are hugely important in these kind of systems. The data is still persisted because you never persist any data inside the container. So if it's something that's fucked up with your you know, the data inside your database, you've got that there. The only thing you're doing is shooting the MySQL daemon. You aren't shooting the data that lives in there. And that's a good segue into our next slide, how you store data. So containers can be shot at any point in time. Where do we store stuff? So Kubernetes allows us to create this concept of a volume or a persistent volume, which is mapped to a pod by a persistent volume claim. Containers within the pod all share the same volumes. So they, if they're mounted into the container, they all look at exactly the same volumes, which is convenient if you need to do something like share a socket. You know, if you want to have something like um, PHP FBM, Sorry. <clears throat> you would put Nginx in a container. You would put PHP FPM in a container. You would put PHP into a container. You're running three containers. They talk to each other across sockets. All you do is between these three, you put a single, it's called empty dir, empty directory, which is just a fake volume. Kubernetes just makes up, here's you know, a tempfs that we're going to mount into the containers for them just to have a socket and to be able to share data in between. Now, they can all talk to each other. Beauty of this is I can update them independently. I don't have to go in and you know, when there's a new update for Nginx, I don't have to go and say, okay, well, in this container, I need to update Nginx. I can just pull in the new Nginx container that's official, and people way smarter than I am, who know how to build containers very small, very effectively, very efficiently, have done all of the hard work for me, and I just pull that in and run it. Sadly, the, because of the limitations of Docker Swarm, 
the official PHP image doesn't do this, but um, that's just because they don't have the concept of pods. They have the concept of a container, and you can't bind the containers together to logically isolate your application, which means that when you run a PHP container, you're actually, instead of starting Nginx, you're running a script that then goes and starts Nginx and PHP and PHP FPM, does all of the coordination so that you can have multiple PIDs running inside this one container, which is horrible and bad. And if you ever run into a situation where you think you need to run more than one PID per container, please, dear God, just come and talk to me. Or Alex, we'll, we'll help you out, because you don't have to. You really don't have to. No, no limitation on PHP, P limitation on Docker Swarm, because they don't have the ability of pods. Oh, Docker Swarm, yeah. yeah. Docker Swarm, Docker is fantastic. Docker Swarm was built with the wrong abstractions, which sucks, but we have Kubernetes instead. Ah, so a volume and a persistent volume. So volumes are... Yeah, so there's a couple of different kinds of volumes that aren't persistent volumes. So there's things like a host path, where you can say, hey, take this data on the host and mount it into me. This is fantastic for applications where you're running it on every single node. So, you know, uh, I run a proxy on every single node in my cluster to proxy traffic between the nodes. If I need to persist state in that, I can persist that to the node. I don't care which node the container ends up on because it doesn't need specific data for the container. It needs specific data for that node to know how to contact the other nodes, right? So in that case, you can mount in things that are for that particular machine, for that particular host. Um, it's been bastardized a lot and misused to like, hey, let's store things locally on this disk. Um, not the best use case. There's better ways to do that, but it, it is an option. Um, there's a couple of other types of volumes, but persistent volumes tend to be things like if you're running on a cloud provider, whatever the cloud provider offers for block storage, um, alternatively, it's something like Ceph or Gluster or other similar things. So, does that kind of make sense? Cool. Mm. All right, so that's the end of this particular slide deck, or very close to it. There's a lot of other things in Kubernetes that are friggin' fantastic that we have nowhere near enough time to cover. Um, namespaces. Namespaces are possibly the most powerful thing in Kubernetes. They allow you to separate things into their own areas. Most of the clusters I run, mostly because I'm crazy, but... Side note, uh, I run dev and production in the same cluster. They run on the same hardware. They're bin packed so that we're using the smallest number of instances possible, which saves us money. But we're able to isolate all of the dev stuff from the production stuff in its entirety just by leveraging namespaces. And if we do want to have specific things talk across namespaces, we can do that. It requires some additional effort to allow cross namespace discussions, we shall call them. But you, you, know, you have this layer of isolation that keeps you separate, but still within the same cluster. You can talk to the same API, and you don't have to differentiate. Um, ingress, layer 7 load balancing, we talked about that a little bit, but 
awesomeness because almost everything outside of the cluster, at least in the modern world, we tend to do layer seven stuff. Unless you're doing something really cool and really fancy, like you happen to work for an email company and you're serving SMTP and POP3 and IMAP, you're going to be doing layer seven HTTP stuff. So that's the ideal way of getting it into your cluster. Deployments give you, they're a wrapper around pods that you say to a deployment, hey, make stuff happen, and it will go and create the pods for you. So um, jobs, there's two types of jobs. One is run to completion, the other is cron jobs. So you can run them at a particular time, or you can run special workloads. So um, auto-scaling, one of the coolest things in Kubernetes is if you have more work, then you have stuff to do the work. As long as you have machines available, you can add more copies of that thing to be able to handle that, that load. Um, and then daemon sets, like I mentioned earlier, if I'm running something like a proxy on every single one of my nodes, I can use a daemon set to do that. So. Clear as mud? Cool. Any questions? It's hot, I'm tired, let's go home.